I'm really excited to go on this cruise because I think it'll be much better than just sitting in a classroom all day. It's hands-on and I'll get a lot more experience out of it. I hope to be part of the group of people that help push this research forward. What I hope to get out of this project is to learn more about marine animals as well as learning about the ocean itself. To get a better understanding of how life in the ocean works. What I'm looking to get out of this trip is to learn more about the patterns of all these whales. An understanding of how marine animals interact with one another and how they affect our lives. I'm looking forward to broadening my horizons as far as what I'm studying. And not everybody gets an opportunity to go out on a research vessel. It's important to share these experiences with the broader public, especially from a student perspective. If I can inspire a flicker of interest in something that I'm already interested in, I've done the basic job of passing on a torch to a younger generation. Not everyone gets a chance to be here at sea on a research cruise, but through the Inner Space Center, now we can bring you with us. Welcome aboard. Hi everybody, welcome to Endeavor Live. My name is Holly Morin and I am a marine biologist with the Inner Space Center and I'll be your host today as we learn about the at-sea research being conducted by a group of oceanographers and eight URI honors students here on board the Endeavor. We're actually going to be chatting with one of those students, Lizzie, in just a little bit. We're currently um, actually right outside of Block Island. We came in here last night to escape the wind and the waves because the seas had kicked up quite a bit. The ship was rocking and rolling, so we headed inshore um, and we're kind of going to stay here for a little bit off the coast of Block Island. Um, if you actually looked out the windows, it's very sunny, um, but if we were to go out on deck, it's very windy, it's quite cold, so that's why we're actually back inside the lab today. Um, we're going to kind of hang here until later this afternoon. We'll try to head back offshore again um, when the seas quiet down. Um, despite the weather and the rolling seas, the students and everybody on board the boat have been very busy. Um, they've been deploying a variety of instruments off the vessel. Um, they've been using something called bongo nets, which are two nets deployed together. Um, and they deploy those to sample plankton and other small critters that are in the water to see what's there. They've used a visual plankton recorder, which is essentially a microscope that they can put over the side and put in the water, and it takes up to 60 images per second um, to actually see what's in the water without having to sample it directly using a net. Um, they've also been sampling different ocean properties using a, a conductivity temperature depth rosette um, and other tools as well. And then when the students have a chance and the scientists have the weather clear, They've been going up on the flying bridge, which is right above the bridge where the uh, captain drives, um, to scan for marine mammals using big binoculars called big eyes. And ultimately, that's what their group is trying to do, is look at the ocean properties, look at the plankton assemblages, try to find some marine mammals if we can, and link those all together into a big picture and see what's going on. Um, want to remind you all, you can actually ask questions during today's broadcast. Um, so please definitely type those in and send those in as soon as they kind of come to your mind. Um, and then whatever ones we can't answer, we'll definitely try to answer offline as well. This is actually a very interactive broadcast. It's being brought to you using something called telepresence. I'm sure many of you have used FaceTime or Skype to connect with your family and friends. And instead, this time around, you're connecting with an oceanographic vessel in real time doing active research. Um, it's the same technology, actually, that they use um, to communicate with astronauts. So what makes the ISC unique in all of this is that we can actually receive, receive the streams of multiple ships all at once, their live audio and visual data, and then stream that back out in real time through the internet. So hopefully you've checked us out online before and seen all the different ships that we connect to. To kick things off, I'm actually going to roll in a quick video to introduce you to the students that are aboard the vessel here, um, and also a little bit of an intro to the work they'll be conducting while they're out at sea. Personally, I think it's really important to communicate all of our findings so everyone has the same access to the same information and knowledge that we do. Because as a student studying to become a scientist, I want to know what it takes to be a scientist out at sea. I'm so excited to be participating in this cruise actually because I'm really curious about the whales and how their environment works. I joined this class by accident, but I'm really happy I'm sticking with it because I've been exposed to so many different research methods and opportunities that I normally wouldn't have gotten. Being from the Cape, uh, I've heard about right whales my whole life and I'm interested in learning more. Because I'm really interested in the ocean, mainly because I'm from an island, I'm from Dominican Republic. There's so many people out there who don't know what they want to do and if I can inspire a flicker of interest in something that I'm already interested in, I think I've done the basic job of passing on a torch to a younger generation. 
I think it's important to communicate science to the general public because we don't always understand how it affects our lives every single day. To get people inspired and motivated into learning what's out there. Because I want to learn about how the changing oceanographic landscape is affecting the whale's pattern and behavior. To have the opportunity to learn about the preservation of endangered whales. I was born in Israel and I moved here when I was six years old and both my parents have a biology background so that's why I became really interested in sciences. As someone studying civil engineering I'm looking forward to broadening my horizons as far as what I'm studying, what I'm researching instead of just concrete. Now I get to study whales and see how statistics changes with that. I'm a very outgoing person. I strive to be the best at anything I can try or be, you know. There's a real value in communicating science to the public because not many people get the opportunity like we do. So being able to broadcast it to a huge audience is something that we're able to give to you. What motivated me to join this class was that I had to fulfill my honors requirement. But what kept me in the class was the prospect of this week-long cruise out on the ocean. And I love boats and that really got me excited for it. Hi everybody again. So joining us now is Lizzie Lagan. She is a junior marine biology major at um, the University of Rhode Island. So Lizzie, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then what made you decide to sign up for this course? I don't think that um, uh, going out on a research cruise or a class like this is something that students usually get access to. So why don't you just share with us a little bit about, about all of that. Okay, so my um, passion for marine biology actually came from a teacher that I had in high school. She taught our honors marine bio class and she was just so passionate and so she just loved the ocean so much that she kind of just passed it on to me. Um, and I kind of signed up for this class um, quite late. Um, it was two weeks into the semester and I got an email from Dr. Wishner and a phone call asking if I would, love, um, would be interested in participating in this class and in the cruise because of my major. Um, and so I'm really excited and just really thankful that this invitation was extended out to me. When you say that you were excited when you were a, a younger, when you were a kid per se, even though I think you're still a kid, but if <laughs> when you were younger, um, is this what you kind of thought of, that these are the types of things you might be getting to do as a, as a marine scientist? Um, when I thought of marine biology in high school, I thought of scuba divers. I never really thought about going out to the open ocean. So being out here and experiencing all of this is just really um, fascinating and exciting. And I hope to see myself doing this in the future. Awesome, great. So uh, what are the types of things that um, you've been working on? I know yesterday, even despite the weather, you were very busy on deck. Um, Lizzie actually, I think, deployed almost all the different instruments that are available to work with on this cruise. So why don't you share a little bit about that? Okay, so um, being out on the ship, I've actually learned that scientists love their acronyms, so maybe you could help me with the names, <laughs> sure, but we did um, deploy something called the CTD. Yep, so that's a conductivity, temperature, depth. Um, it's a rosette, <laughs> so you've got all the different um, water containers together kind of in a spiral or in a circle. Yeah. And yep. that, that can be used to collect water samples from different depths of the ocean. Um, that's actually linked to one of the many computers that we have on board and they can determine what depth they want to close those water containers so that they can bring up water samples when the machine comes back up. We've also launched an echo sounder mm -hmm. um, and that just uses sound to, it releases a sound wave and if it hits something out in the open ocean it'll, it'll bounce back and the machine is able to kind of figure out what's out there. Um, we've also deployed an XBT which stands for an expendable bathio Bathio thermograph, yep. um, and that just reads um, the temperature out in the out in the ocean, which is really cool because that sends back information live instead of having to wait for something to come back up. Mm -hmm. Excellent, yeah. And so again, looking at all these different parameters of the ocean are really important because the temperature, the salinity, um, and other things that the scientists are measuring are really going to drive where they drive currents, it drives where food's going to be and ultimately then will pop up or show where the whales might be or the other animals that scientists are interested in. Um, I want to remind everybody that you do have questions and if, you're, if you think of any questions, um, I forgot to give a nod earlier to Gwen. So Gwen is another one of our URI honor students that's on board the vessel today and she is going to be fielding all of your questions and relaying them to us here on the boat. Um, so definitely as you think of your questions, type those in. There's a little chat box um, that appears underneath the video viewer from which you should be viewing the broadcast. Um, so as you think of those, definitely um, relay them to your teacher or just type them in yourself. Um, Lizzie, a, a question to follow up kind of on your experiences that you've had on board the deck and then thinking back to how you were so passionate as this as a younger child. Um, 
these steps that you've taken now, this experience, how do you think this is going to impact you or your future as a, a marine scientist, your, your maybe potential future career, even impact you as a student? Um, well, I don't want to go back, I'm, um, <laughs> but um, um, college is where you are trying to find where you want to be and where you don't want to be, and being able to go out on this ship on the Endeavor with my honors class um, has shown me what I want to do. Um, so, yeah. That's good. That's good. So, I, w I should note too, when Lizzie was saying she doesn't want to go back, so one thing that we do when we're on board the boat, one of the first things you do is you review your safety protocols. Um, and so you're learning about what to do in case there's an emergency. And one thing that you often, you have to learn is how to put on your safety <laughs> emergency suit, your Gumby suit. Um, and Lizzie was by far the most <laughs> excited individual I've ever seen to don an emergency suit. Um, and with her petite stature, they're very big suits. So I tried to get a, a picture of you when you were putting it on, but her enthusiasm to put on an emergency suit was pretty fantastic um, and well appreciated. Um, and then, um, so one last question. Yesterday when it was kind of rocking and rolling, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people hear about high seas and is it something that made you a little anxious or did it, was anybody getting seasick? How was it yesterday on so, the boat? So, unfortunately, there were a few of us that were feeling a little seasick, but today it looks like a lot of us are feeling a lot better. Um, and the weather was something I was really nervous about, but I was lucky enough to not feel so sick. Um, and it did make deploying the instruments a little challenging but um, it was doable. So. Oh, okay, good, good. So um, we're gonna take our first question then. I saw that Gwen was writing things down, so I um, wanna make sure we get to your question. So Gwen, if you wanna relay that first question, we'll get things kicked off. So from, so from Malona School, we have, um, what do you mean by the oceanographic changes we are seeing? Okay, so this is the Lawn Ave School in Jamestown. Great question. They are curious about these oceanographic features and how they are changing. Do you want me to feel that yeah, one? Okay, <laughs> so, so when we're talking about the oceanographic features, there are different properties in the ocean. The most common ones that get measured are you look at your temperature over time, you look at salinity. They also might be looking at dissolved oxygen, so how much oxygen is available in the water at a certain time. And if you look at those, those features will actually change as you go down in the water to depth. And what they generate is something called a profile. Um, so just like if Lizzie's face from the side, it's a profile, it's kind of the same type of picture they draw of those changes over time on a graph. And what that then sets up is it lets you know where layers of plankton might be based on the temperature. Um, or it might be where layers of or currents are going to flow because, of course, temperature and salinity are what are going to drive currents. And all of those features aren't static. The ocean is very dynamic. It's going to change with seasons. It changes with the climate, changes with the weather. We've had, you know, if you look at what the seas we were having, it was, um, it was very rough. So even from the echo sounder, it's picking up more bubbles because of all the sea spray. Um, so that's what they're really looking looking at, but they're looking at it from a, a in a, a much longer time scale. So you really start to see trends, is what they call it in scientific terms, those changes over long data sets. And then you can start to predict what might happen in the future if similar types of um, climate changes or other things happen. Um, that's where they start to be able to predict things going forward. Gwen, do you have another question for us? Yes. So from Rogers High School in Newport, they're asking, where are we going on the cruise and where are we now? So Rogers, Rogers High School is asking, where are we going on this cruise? Uh, this is Rogers High School out in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, and um, they would like to know where we're going and where are we right now? Well, right now we are off the coast of Block Island. Mm -hmm. um, we did have to come in because the weather was a little too rough last night, so we came to hide from the winds. And hopefully we're going to where the whales are. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, the weather was kind of bad last night, so it was hard to kind of figure out where the whales would be with the weather and all the fog. Right, so yesterday we were south of Nantucket Shoals. So if you're familiar with Martha's Vineyard, we were kind of southwest of there. Um, but as the seas kicked up, we decided to steam back to tuck in or to gain some um, coverage from Block Island to protect, to protect us from the wind. Um, and then the plan is the seas should be quieting down later this afternoon. 
So we're going to actually try to transit due south, pretty much straight out to where whales have been sighted previously. And the whales we're specifically looking for are going to be right whales. Um, and these are a critically endangered species of whale. There's only less than 500 of them in the population for the North Atlantic right whale are left. So figuring out where they might be and what's driving their distribution is really quite important for management and conservation measures. Gwen, it looks like you were writing down one more question for us there. Yep. So another question from Rogers High School in Newport. Um, what is the biggest animal we've seen so far? So Rogers High School out of Newport is asking us, what is the biggest animal we have seen thus far? Lizzie, what is the biggest animal you've seen? Um, well, I've been out on the deck. I haven't had a chance to go on the Marine Mammal Watch, but the biggest animal I've seen was a bird. <laughs> well, technically, I think we are the biggest animals we've <laughs> seen. So we've seen humans. Um, yeah. But because of the sea state, they really haven't been able to um, distinguish any, or it's been the marine mammal surveys have been very difficult. Um, so when you're looking even through the big eye binoculars, it's um, a little bit disorienting with the seas and the heaving of the ship. Um, and so they have seen some birds. We've seen some gannets, which are a pretty common seabird that we see off of the coast of New England. Um, but beyond that, we haven't had, unfortunately, any marine mammal sightings as of yet. So hopefully today will be the day where that changes. Um, but then if you're thinking about plankton, you guys have been looking at a lot of plankton even under the microscope. And some things are very small, only micro, micrometers, but then they can get up to a couple of centimeters. There was a Tina 4 that I know Gwen was actually looking at, um, and she was, um, it was a pleurobrachia, to slow down when we say our Latin terms, um, a type of jellyfish um, that I could actually see in her petri dish with the naked eye. So even our plankton, even though they're very tiny, they do range in size pretty dramatically. I think we have one more question, Gwen. All right, so lastly from the Law Lab School, um, as marine biologists, what do we hope to see at sea? So the Law Nav School is asking us as marine biologists, what do we hope to see? Well, we hope to see some whales, um, just so that we can tie that in with all the smaller organisms like the zooplankton and the tunophores that we've been finding to maybe create um, a correlation mm -hmm. and hopefully be able to detect where we might be able to find whales and where we might not. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different whale species that actually occur off of the coast of Rhode Island and New England in general. So there are two groups of whales. So you've got your baleen whales, which the right whales are one of those types of whales. Um, and these are the ones that have long hairs um, hanging from their mouths. Um, and depending on what they feed upon with their filter feeding on, those hairs will be either be really, really skinny and long, or they might be a little bit broader and shorter. Um, so you've got right whales, you've got humpback whales, minke whales, whales yes, yeah, yeah. say whales and fin whales. Um, those last ones are actually very difficult to see because their bodies are so streamlined and you only usually see a very small dorsal mm -hmm. fin. Most people think of humpback whales when they think of whales off of our coast and those are the ones that tip up their flukes, their tails, so you get a nice picture of them when they're diving. Um, there are also some toothed whale species out here as well, so dolphins and porpoises um, that we may see. So as much as we're focusing on the right whales, the patterns and distribution of all of these marine mammals in these waters, that's ultimately what they're trying to look at because they've been shifting. Um, the whales showed up in pretty predictable areas for the last decade or so. And then within this last year, the whales have started to show up a little bit more off of Rhode Island and off of um, southern New York. Um, and they used to just be a migratory corridor for the animals, but now they're showing a little bit more residency period. I'm sure some of you remember last summer we actually had humpback whales right off of, Nar um, off of uh, Narragansett Beach. Um, so trying to understand those patterns and see if we can find some of those whales and correspond them to the oceanographic data we're collecting will be great. So now we're going to take one last question from Gwen. Again, thank you so much. You guys have been fabulous asking all these questions. Um, from Rogers High School, how is the food on the ship? How is the food on the ship? Excellent question, Rogers. This is our actually our first food question that we've gotten. So, yeah. Lizzie, how um, has the food been? It's been amazing. I don't know how I'm going to go back to school um, without the chefs that have been on board. <laughs> it's better than the cafeteria. Oh, food. yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, this morning we had banana pancakes. There were a bunch of fruit, um, but they've been taking really good care of us um, food-wise. So, yeah. yeah, we always say that the chef is one of the most important people on the boat because if you're out and even in the crummy weather we had yesterday and if people aren't eating well, then they're not going to be happy. But if you're eating well and you have access to ice cream and candy bars and Lord oh, yeah. knows whatever else is on this vessel, um, everybody's happy. We were all in sugar highs, but um, <laughs> it's good spirits and so that way you can continue your work and have a positive attitude about it. Um, thank you so much for all of those excellent questions. Thank you, Gwen, for fielding them today. Um, and thank you, Lizzie, for sharing all of your thoughts and experiences and 
um, what's going on with this cruise. We really appreciate it. Um, we appreciate you all taking time to explore with us this morning. We hope that you have a fabulous Thursday. I want to encourage you all to check out our Facebook page um, and continue to follow along with this expedition and other expeditions um, through Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, and Instagram as well. The students have been taking over our Instagram account. Lizzie had it on the first day and was a rock star at it. Um, they've been sharing their experiences and posting lots of pictures, so that's been lots of fun. Make sure you check out our website, um, the Inner Space Center's website online as well, um, so that you can see all the different activities that will be up and coming. I know the Okeanos Explorer will actually be starting their season with ROV dives next week, so something to follow along and tune in with. Um, there are other Facebook Live events, too, that are happening from this cruise. We sail all the way through Sunday, so again, follow along when you can. And if you have any additional questions, use the hashtag Endeavor Live, and you can post those online, and we'll try to follow up and answer them. Otherwise, have an awesome day and a great weekend, and thanks again for tuning in. See you later. Thank you.